this this mental note that you make of, hey, look, it's hard to go into these rooms, but it's not about me. It's about making these guys feel better. I learned I learned a lot on those first trips. Landstuhl was the first military hospital that I went to. Uh, and they're fresh off the battlefield, as you know. Uh, you know, and the the guys that I described yeah, literally in, hours. I mean, they hours, could be hours yeah. off the battlefield. And as soon as I got there, uh, the bus pulled up. Uh, we we were just about ready to get out of the bus, and um, a fresh batch of wounded were were they were just pulling a bus up. The airplane had just gotten in. They put them on the bus. They brought them to the hospital entrance that we were going in and they were all of a sudden all these all these technicians and everybody started running out of the hospital and started unloading this bus which was just nothing but gurneys with wires and you know uh, wounded wounded folks on these gurneys and I just sat there and watched them unload the bus of gurneys and then I had to go in, and uh, I was apprehensive about it, to tell you the truth. I didn't know how I was going to react to seeing somebody with their legs gone or any of that kind of thing. So, um, But I learned a lot on that first trip, and within two weeks I was at Bethesda and Walter Reed, and I was doing that. <clears throat> at one point, um, you see Kid Rock doing what Kid Rock does which is delivering the justice of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was watching MTV with my wife. And on MTV, this was 2000. This was either 1998 or 1999 or 2000. I don't know, but I was in Virginia Beach. And Kid Rock, this person no one had ever heard of, was playing the Spring Break special <laughs> at, on MTV. And he played Ba with a Ba or whatever that song is. <laughs> he played that song. Sure. And I looked at my wife and I said, this guy is going to be huge. And sure enough, Kid sure Rock. Enough. I called, called it. it. I yeah. called it. Yeah. Did he have that little little person yes. dancing around? I don't know if he had, I don't know if he had that little dude with, <laughs> with him or not. I remember that. The first time I saw him, I said, this is unusual. <laughs> but I'll tell you, like, no kidding. When I saw him for the first time, I was like, this this guy is, this guy rocks. Yeah. I called it, Echo uh, Charles. I, I, we we had a good it. time we had it together on that. It was fun. Uh, so you see that. And, of course, you know, despite you doing this acting and directing whatever, what's your true What's your true desire is to be a rock and roll star? <laughs> so you say to the USO people, "Hey, uh, I'd like to, I, you know, I play. I got a band because you had done you done a little gig with your friends, and so now you say, hey, 'Hey, I'd like to go on tour as well.'" And they kind of shine you on. Yeah, a, li- a little bit. I mean, an actor <laughs> with a band is not in- interesting <laughs> <laughs> not much. Uh, but you drive on and you put together the the Lieutenant Dan band and. Your first show is at Diego Garcia, which only someone in the military could laugh at because Diego Garcia is an island in the middle of the Pacific. It's as far away it's as you can imagine. It's the most remote yeah. place in the world. They're like, oh, you want to go on tour? Cool. Start with <laughs> Diego Garcia. Yeah. Well, here's, here's the thing about that, Jocko. They, you know, I bugged them over and over. I went on six tours that year. And every time I'd go on a tour, I would bug them. You know, I've got musicians I play with. I want to entertain the troops. I don't, I'm just shaking hands and yeah. taking pictures. Finally, after six tours, they knew I was serious. And they said, okay, we'll set up a tour for you. <laughs> they didn't ask me for a CD to even hear if the band was any good. Mm-hmm. So what they did was just send us as far away as possible. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> you know? And uh, nobody would ever hear about us, I guess. <laughs> um, and you end up playing 30, 40, 50 shows a year. We've, um, the first stuff we did was in 03. The first place we played was uh, Great Lakes Naval Base, which was right near where I grew up. And we played there in November of 03, uh, be- right before my second t- tour to Iraq, uh, handshake tour. And then they set up the, the tour to Korea, Diego Garcia, Singapore in February of 04 and I haven't stopped since now my foundation produces a, a, most of our shows I do only a few with the USO each year 
but I think from 2003 to to now, we're almost near nearing 500 shows for the military in the, in that 16 year period. Impressive, and that's the only reason I have the band. I don't I don't play for money. Uh, <laughs> I play for free. I have to pay the band and everything, but I, I I play for free. I make my my living as an actor. So uh, this the, the band is a part of my foundation, and uh, people donate to the USO. You know they're going to send entertainment. You donate to the Gary Sinise Foundation, and, and one of the things that we do is we provide this this entertainment piece, and I've played on bases all over the world with this band, and then we continue to do it. You know, a uh, couple of days we're at Naval Medical Center doing one of our festivals, so we, we continue to get out there and get at it. Uh Another thing you do is you pick up um, the lead role in uh, CSI New York. That's a, a, a huge deal that happens. Um, kind of, this is another little layer, if you will. As you're as you're figuring out the character, um, you want him to be a vet. The character's original name was Rick Carlucci, <laughs> and you didn't write. You didn't really like that. You, you were meeting with Anthony. Who's Anthony, the writer? Anthony Zeiger created CSI. Got it. Yeah. And so you say, hey, can we change the name? Uh, Anthony asked me for ideas for a new name. I gave him a list of suggestions for both the first and last name. The name I liked most was Mac, for obvious reasons. For the last name, I suggested the surname of Lieutenant Dan. Anthony wrestled around with suggestions along with some others before coming to me and saying, let's do it. Right away, I felt gung-ho for my character's new name, Mac Taylor. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, good layer, we'll say. Um, and then just about the about the CSI New York from 2004 until 2013, nine seasons, 197 original episodes. I portrayed Detective Mac Taylor on CSI New York. The show ranked as high as number 17 on Nielsen and evened out to about 10 million viewers per episode, considered quite good. Today it's been shown in more than 200 markets all over the world and continues to run in syndication. Eventually comic books, novels, a video game, and even a slot machine in Vegas came out based on the show. Although at first I didn't, un- didn't see what a blessing it would be, the series became one of the greatest gifts ever handed to me. Nine seasons on television is a tremendous success. It gave me the resources I could never have imagined. It allowed me the financial and logistical freedom, freedom to take good care of my family and continue my mission of supporting the troops. I will always be proud to have portrayed U.S. Marine Corps veteran and 9-11 family member, Detective Mac Taylor on CSI New York. Does that, what's the role that you get recognized for the most? Still Lieutenant Dan? Um, could, could be, yeah. But uh, CSI New York, when you're on television every week, mm-hmm. you know, for I mean, ten, for a decade. Yeah, you know, it, it it changed, and then I did another series, Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, for a couple of seasons after that. So, you know, primarily, uh, I think it's it's probably between Mac Taylor and and, and Lieutenant Dan. Uh, but you know, and when I when I went overseas, I you know, one time I'm up on the DMZ in Korea, right, and I'm doing a tour with the band over in Korea, and we we go up to the DMZ to look around and get a tour up there and i'm in the gift shop there's a gift shop on the dmz you know you got to go buy some dmz stuff <laughs> and a group of asian tourists a tour bus pulls up and the asian tourists come out and they come into the into the uh into the gift shop and there's 50 it's packed in there with the tourists and they're looking at stuff and so all of a sudden one sees me and you go matt taylor (laughs) and all of a sudden the whole place goes nuts and here i am on the dmz in a gift shop with all the tourists screaming about csi new york It, it was completely surreal but it was it's because it, internationally it was it was very popular in yeah. certain places it was very popular in south korea yeah that's crazy <laughs> uh next section that you talk about is um you're back in iraq we suited up in helmets and bulletproof vests and drove out uh, in a convoy of Humvees to visit one of the Iraqi elementary schools that U.S. troops had been working to improve. It was November 2003, my second tour of Iraq with the USO. 
The school itself wasn't considered dangerous, but the roads to the school and back were always suspect, particularly when traveling with U.S. military. So you roll into this school. I couldn't help but notice how many children sat at each desk. The desks looked longer than typical American school desks, perhaps built to seat two comfortably, yet three to four children huddled at each desk. Each little group would share one pencil stub, passing it back and forth amongst themselves, working on just a few sheets of paper. These desks and pencils were the only school equipment I saw. When I asked why the Iraqi children didn't have more supplies, the surprising answer came back, because we can't get them. Skipping forward here as we headed back to base in our convoy, an idea started to percolate in the back of my mind, but I didn't say anything at first. It was... Wasn't a big idea initially. It was just simply reflecting the phrase that was digging deep into my heart. I can do more. And then you start going and gathering up school supplies for Iraqi children. And that becomes your next, um, I'd say your next tactical mission was getting these, getting kids school supplies over there. You, you hook up with um, Laura Hildenbrand who wrote Seabiscuit and Unbroken. And you start this this thing, Operation Iraqi Children, which eventually becomes Operation International Children. And you guys uh, just supply you supply all this all this gear to these kids. Well, the, the important part of of that was that we wanted to give it to the troops to give to the kids. Got it. So the, our our little motto was helping soldiers help children. Uh, I I just felt you know I, on that first trip to the school I saw how much the kids were loving the the soldiers you know the soldiers rebuilt the school they came in there put windows in they did all kinds of stuff for the kids and the kids were very grateful the soldiers were just hugging the kids and it was a spirit that I thought was very important to preserve in some way and uh, so I thought well maybe we can collect some school supplies and send them to those troops and they can take them out to the school and give them to the kids and that's what we did we collected stuff at my kids school and we shipped it over to that base and they took it out and gave it to the kids and it turned into a program that lasted nine years and we sent hundreds of thousands of school supply kits soccer balls uh, shoes all kinds of stuff to to not only iraq but afghanistan haiti all these different places yeah that's that's a that's a strategic move too, because as these young kids see the American soldiers, what do they see of them? Right? They see guys with guns. They see guys kicking in doors, and that can obviously give a real negative impression. But then when they see a kid, I mean, they see a soldier, and he's giving them crayons and soccer balls and whatnot. All of a sudden, they realize, oh, these guys are these guys are here to help, which is sometimes not obvious. That that was the important part of what we're trying to do. I knew I couldn't keep running over to Iraq every month, you know, but I wanted to do something from home. And so supplying the troops with something to give the kids was a way that we could do that. And then, I mean, you just get involved in all kinds of things. Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund, Fisher House Foundation, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Um, you end up doing something called the Snowball Express. Idea was simple. Going from the book, they brought a, they brought the children of our fallen heroes to Disneyland just before Christmas to allow them to meet each other, to see they were not alone in their grief, and to bring them some joy and new happy memories to this special group of children who are experiencing so much sadness, especially at Christmas. And 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 you go on talking about that. I could not be prouder to be part of creating opportunities for joy, friendship, and communal healing by connecting families struggling. With with loss to one another. Together they share a common bond and can feel a bigger part of a bigger family. The children meet and interact with others who understand what they've been through and each and help each other through this unique and terrible experience. It cannot be overstated what an event like this can mean to a child who has lost a parent or in military service. Struggling with their grief can be overwhelming and uniting together with hundreds of other children experiencing similar tragic loss can be the magic that carries them throughout the year there's so much joy on their faces during these moments it's a blessing to interact with kids this way at the same time i'm always reminded of the solemnity embedded in these moments of the incredible cost represented in the faces of the children who come to this event last year one girl wore a t-shirt to the event 
with these words printed on the back. In honor and memory of, and underneath the words was a blank box.